Hello, class. So this week、um, we are talking about China. So so far we've talked about Africa. We've talked about imperialism in Africa. We have also talked about India and how the British took over India. Now we're looking at China, but the difference in China is that China is actually able to resist Europe, Europe for quite some time. Here's some of our objectives. First one: explain China's resistance to foreigners. Describe rebellions that shook China. Summarize effects of Chinese, China's reforms, and the last one is trace the growth of nationalism there. Okay, so again we have this idea of nationalism. Okay, it's coming up again and again. Now we have nationalism looking from a Chinese perspective. Now the reason why it's important to look at China is, well, first of all, China is our large neighbor to the left of us. It is important to understand. Why is it that China never had a huge European influence over them? So, looking at the beginning, we have China in the West. So,、um, many dynasties in China、um, had rejected the West up until this point. Even though China had rejected gifts brought from the West, that doesn't mean that Europe is not still trying to influence China. In 1793, we have China,、uh, we have gifts coming from Europe, from the British ambassador. These gifts are, are、um, musical instruments,、um, things like clocks and globes,、um, any and even a hot air balloon. Okay, but the Chinese emperor does not respond well to these gifts. Basically, what he does is he says, "These are strange." China doesn't need them, and he sends them back. The reason why China was so easily able to reject、uh, Western Europe and Western influence is because they were self-sufficient. They had a huge agricultural economy. They also had mining, manufacturing sec- sectors that were highly productive. To China, China was able to run, was able to have enough resources in their country that they didn't really need to trade with Western Europe. On the contrary, though, Western Europe wanted things that China was producing. Some of these things included things like silk. There was high-quality cotton products, fine porcelain. Porcelain is、um, types of dishes. Okay. There is also、um, Western Europe wanted to get a hold of a lot of Chinese resources. China had industries of salt, silver, and iron. All of these things are things that the West wanted. The West was determined to find a product that China would want. This product ended up being opium. Now, if you remember from last week, a lot of the opium that Britain ended up Transporting to China was actually from India. Now, if you don't know what opium is, opium is a narcotic. It's a drug, and many doctors in China were using opium at this time to、uh, to relieve pain. But opium is also、uh, made into a drug that we call now heroin. That means that m- it started catching on this idea of smoking opium. Many British ended up smuggling opium from India into China, and many Chinese they ended up becoming addicted. This is probably one of the only products that the West successfully was able to smuggle and trade in China. The reason why China was able to control their trade so much is they made the only place that Westerners could trade was in、um, Guangzhou. Guangzhou is a southern port in China. Basically, by making their trading port at Guangzhou, China is able to earn more money from its exports than on its imports. So basically, they are able to tax everything that is coming in from outside in one place in China, which allows China to gain more money. China and the West. So the West have now、um, officially been able to trade one thing to China, and that is opium. And as I said, opium is a drug. This is not making the Qin Emperor very happy. 
Not only has the West figured out how to smuggle in a product, but that product is ruining the lives of Chinese people. This ultimately ends up in a war called the Opium War. Now what ends up happening is the Qin dynasty, the Qin Emperor, he is trying to contact Queen Victoria of England. And he's talking to Queen Victoria about trying to um, stop British from smuggling in opium in China. What ends up happening is um, Queen Victoria basically ignores this and this causes a lot of tension between British and Chinese. So in 18, uh, 1839, we have a fight happening. Now this fight is happening on the water. We have Chinese boats, which are very outdated, fighting British, the British uh, modern Navy. Now the Industrial Revolution has already happened and Britain has, ha has the top of the line boats for technology a lot with steam power and this results in China losing. From this we get the Treaty of Nanjing. This is in 1842. So as you can see this war lasted three years. In the Treaty of Nanjing this is when Britain takes control of Hong Kong. Now as you can see today Hong Kong has a lot of English speakers. This is happening already in 1842 with the Treaty of Nanjing. Also later on in 1844, we have other nations are getting extra territorial rights. What that means is now there is a trading post in China that Britain controls. No longer a Chinese trading post. That means that other nations are gonna come to Hong Kong and they're going to use that as a trading post for China because China is not really letting in other trading from other parts of their country. This also means that foreigners are exempt from laws in Guangzhou and these other ports, which means that all that extra taxation that China was gaining from only having their ports in the south is now gone because everyone is going to Hong Kong instead. So even though China does not really accept foreign trade and is upset about Hong Kong being taken over by Britain, that is sort of the least of China's problems. Another thing that ends up happening during this time period is that China's population is increasing 30% in only 60 years. So from 1790 to 1850, we have an increase of population but since China has not industrialized like many of its European counterparts, their crops are not yielding or growing that much food to supply that many people. This ultimately leads to Chinese people uh, rebelling against, against the Qing Dynasty. The major rebellion from this time is called the Taiping Rebellion. Now I'm sure you guys know what Taiping means in Chinese. As I, my understanding is that it means the Peace Rebellion, or the Great Peace Rebellion. So in the late 1830s, we have this leader, now I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, his name is Hong Xiuquan, Xiu, Xiuquan. you can make fun of me in class. He, this leader, he is recruiting up to a million people in an army. And what they are trying to do is they're trying to build a new China. Now within 20 years, this leader Hong, he is actually quite successful. He is able by the 1850s to actually capture a good chunk of the southern part of China. What he ends up doing is they eventually end up capturing the city of Nanjing. They declare Nanjing their capital. But Hong, he does not really want to be the leader. He leads the movement, but he leaves it up to his friends and family to sort of take over this empire now. He sort of um, goes into the background. 
There is no strong leader at this time, and there is a lot of internal fighting. The Qin Dynasty is not just going to let Hong and his rebellion take over the southern half. The other thing is we have a lot of foreign influence coming in and also trying to attack. This ultimately, uh, this ultimately ends the Taiping Rebellion, but even though that they um, gain some land, it ends up basically getting taken back right away. But what is one thing that is important to note is that this rebellion ends up killing up to 20 million, if not estimated 40 million people. It was quite a devastating and violent rebellion. So here we have as the leader. This is Hong, I'm not going to say his last name because I keep on messing it up, okay? And here we have an example of the Taiping Rebellion down here. This marks, after the Taiping Rebellion, this marks a change in China. What starts to happen is we have more foreign influence in China. The reason is that because China continues to have internal problems, the foreigners are starting to see this and they decide that they are going to attack. One person who is more traditional in China is Dowager Empress Shi Ji. I'm probably also messing that up. So the Dowager, she is ruling um, the empire for about 50 years, or actually sorry, 40 years. And even though she's very traditional and wants to keep foreign, foreign influence out, she also supports reforms. Many of these reforms lead to better education in China. There's also more government in China, meaning more people have control of, the, of, of their say. There's also, she starts to improve military power in China as well. This does not keep foreign influence out. Foreigners are keep on attacking and what ends up happening is China suffers. They, are, they have to give more and more rights to other nations to keep it from going to war with these nations. The main person who is taking control of a lot of China is Japan. Japan gains the sphere of influence. That means that Japan ends up controlling a lot of the economy in China. Now at this point, the U.S. is getting worried. The U.S. is one of the only countries that China is trading with at this time. So as a way to stop imperialism and colonization in China, that means the complete takeover from European countries in Japan, they declare something called the open door policy. And what this means is that China should open their economic doors to trade with anyone who would like to. This would secure um, U.S. trade in China. This also means that there was no imperialism in China as well. We do not have um, we do not have people coming in and completely taking over China. Even though imperialism does not happen in China, there is resentment. Chinese are still resenting the fact that outsiders have come in. What this ends up doing is we have the rise of nationalism in China. One person to know is that Shi Ji, the Dowager, she is one of these persons that starts reforms in China. We also have the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion is basically anti-government and anti-European peasants. What they're doing is that they are la launching a campaign of reforms in China. And these rebels, they end up taking over Beijing away from the foreign army. This rebellion ultimately ends up failing. But out of this rebellion we have a strong sense of Chinese identity. So here we have some pictures of Boxer Rebellion.